The Institute for Health and Healing is a comprehensive integrative medicine program at Sutter Health dedicated to healing people and transforming healthcare. Check us out at myhealthandhealing.org or on Facebook. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker tonight, um, Dr. Jennifer Griffin. Dr. Griffin, oh, I'm going to put on my glasses. Maybe the glasses won't be needed after tonight, I hope. <laughs> uh, Jennifer is an integrative med medicine physician at the Institute for Health and Healing. She practices out of our Green Break Clinic. So as Judith said, we have um, clinics in San Francisco, in Marin, and in uh, Santa Rosa as part of um, SPMF. She's, a board, she's board certified in family medicine, and she's also certified in integrative medicine. She did her training at St. George's University in Granada, along with hospital training in New York and California. So she's uh, spanned both coasts. Um, in addition, she completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona and advanced training at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. So she comes with incredible um, expertise in evidence-based complementary therapies, holistic, functional medicine, and nutrition. She sees adults and teenagers coping with acute and chronic illnesses, as well as those who just want to stay healthy and seek preventive care. And she integrates a wide range of conventional and complementary medicines in her work. Dr. Griffin believes that optimal health is built upon a strong therapeutic relationship between physician and patient, and that effective treatment engages the entire person, mind, body, and spirit. Dr. Griffin enlists her patient's participation in creating care plans to facilitate um, their innate healing uh, capacities. And her goal is to fully support patients as they move toward balance, fulfillment, and increased vitality in their daily lives. So with all of that, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Griffin, and um, we're really, I'm really excited to hear what you're going to tell us. Thank you, Dr. Breyer, for that lovely introduction. Wow. Um, I'm so pleased to be here tonight um, and to see all of you and to be able to do a case presentation that gives all of you a look at an integrative and functional medicine approach to hormone balance. So tonight I'll briefly speak to what integrative and functional medicine is, as some of you may not be familiar with those terms. Then I'll dive into a case about a woman in perimenopause, and her key issue is something called estrogen dominance. I'll talk about what that is, how it presents, what some contributing factors are, and then move into a treatment plan. So I often get asked by my patients if there's a difference between integrative and functional medicine, and I thought I'd briefly speak to that. As many of us know, integrative medicine is a holistic approach that brings Western and Eastern treatment approaches and philosophies together to treat disease and restore wellness. Functional medicine uses that same approach and places a heavy emphasis on identifying root causes for disease, often using complex testing. So I've listed here a few of those tests that we might use in functional medicine, one being a comprehensive stool profile to look at gut health and the microbiome, which we've all heard a lot about lately. A few more I've listed there, including saliva hormone testing, which I'll show you tonight in this case. So again, both integrative and functional medicine um, bring this whole person approach, meaning realizing that we're all by we all have biopsychosocial spiritual aspects to ourselves, and all of these aspects can contribute to our current state of health. There's a strong emphasis on food and lifestyle as medicine. So in integrative mes medicine, we're always addressing nutrition, sleep, stress, and sometimes looking at toxin exposures, and treatment plans are very personalized as a result. So let me introduce you to Linda. She's a 43-year-old female. And when I met Linda, um, we sat down, started to talk. 
the first thing she said was, I just don't feel like myself anymore. I'm sure some of you might be able to relate to that. I know I can, and that's part of what drives my passion for this work. Um, so getting to know Linda, she, her symptoms that she came to me with was she's been feeling more tired over the last six to nine months, having some anxiety, experiencing some irritability with her husband and her children. That irritability is worse that first week before her period. She's having a harder time focusing. Her sleep has been more restless and she's just not handling stress like she used to, which is really perplexing her. Um, so I have an hour in this first visit with my patients, and during that hour, I'm, it's really about getting her story. We talk in medicine about gathering a history, and this is her story. So it's a nice amount of time, which is helpful, and I find, so Linda's story is she's happily married. She homeschools her two children, who are ages seven and nine, she volunteers in her homeschool community and on weekends works part-time in her husband's business and also is running her kids around for, for their extracurricular activities. Her husband works in his own business full-time. One week a month he's traveling, so she's managing the house on her own that week. And I always ask my patients um, what their stress management is like, what do they do to relieve stress, and for Linda, her only real downtime was an hour of television after her children go to bed. So she doesn't smoke, she's drinking six to eight drinks a week, sometimes a little more. She's having at least two cups of coffee a day, lately needing a third to get her through the afternoon, and she's exercising maybe one to two times a week. So more of Linda's story, she's gained 15 pounds in the last two years and she'd like to get rid of that. Her bowels have been sluggish, she's dealing with some constipation, the PMS symptoms that I mentioned, um, and her periods have changed in that they're becoming heavier and they're happening more often, which can happen in perimenopause. In addition to that, her libido's tanked, and that's never fun. So four months prior to seeing me, Linda had gone to her primary care physician, and her physician had recommended an antidepressant to manage her mood and her PMS symptoms, exercise to help lose weight, and had prescribed her some birth control pills to, manage, to regulate her periods. So Linda did, in fact, take the antidepressant for three months and stopped it after that as she felt like it was numbing her emotions. Um, she'd like to exercise more, but she's really seeking guidance on how to fit that into her life. And she never did take the birth control pills. She just didn't like the idea of taking hormonal contraception to manage her symptoms. So I often go through a typical day during that first visit so I can really understand what a patient's life is like. And for Linda, she's getting up at 6.30, um, she's very tired when she wakes up, she's needing coffee right away, and she's getting her kids up, moving into breakfast. Breakfast is often bagel or an oatmeal, and um, she's having that second cup of coffee, then moving into her morning's homeschool session. Lunch is often a sandwich, sometimes a soda. Then into her afternoon homeschool session, midway through, she's crashing, and she's needing either a third cup of coffee or a 30-minute nap. So dinner is not so unusual. She's having vegetables and meat some nights or rice and, or excuse me, pasta and salad a couple nights a week, maybe one night a week uh, pizza. And most nights she's having a glass of wine with dinner. Dessert three to four times a week. Then she's into her evening with putting the kids to bed, doing chores, wrapping things up. And by 10 o'clock, she's very tired. But this is her time now, and she just wants to go sit on the couch, veg out, and sometimes she's having a second glass of wine. So this is, and I go through this, I know it's a little boring to go through everything she's eating, but it's important because it's, a lot of this is what a lot of us eat, right? It's not so terrible. She's not eating fast food. She's not eating candy every night. Um, but in fact, Linda's diet is promoting inflammation. And the reason that is, is because she's eating too many carbohydrates and sugar, she's got too much caffeine on board, which is probably impacting her sleep, and she's not getting enough of those important phytonutrients from fruits and vegetables, not enough hydration, and that, with not enough exercise, is a recipe for inflammation. 
So we want to remember inflammation is actually not a bad word, right? It's in acute situations, it's meant to help our tissues repair, but chronic inflammation is a bad thing and can lead to chronic disease, and there's a lot of evidence to back that up now. So initially I run some standard labs on Linda, including a complete blood count um, to make sure she's not anemic, and she's not. In addition, I did an iron level, and I always run both of those if uh, periods are starting to become heavier. And in her iron, in fact, was low. And I point that out because often women are not anemic, but their iron is low, and that can lead to that sluggishness and difficulty concentrating. Her vitamin B12 was normal, her vitamin D was low, and her thyroid labs showed that she had mildly decreased thyroid function. So next, um, I ordered a saliva hormone panel on Linda, and I chose that because saliva is non-invasive, it's easy to collect, and I can check cortisol levels both in the morning and in the evening. Um, and I'll speak to that in a minute. So for Linda, get my little pointer here. Um, what's going on with her is you can see her estrogen level is normal, her testosterone level's fine, but her progesterone level is way low. And this is where I want to introduce to you the concept of estrogen dominance, which is due to either high estrogens or an in inadequate amount of progesterone. So in Linda's case, she has an excess of estrogen relative to her progesterone levels, and we call that estrogen dominance, and that can lead to a lot of the symptoms that she's experiencing. So in addition to those numbers, I also checked her cortisol levels, remembering cortisol is our stress hormone. Cortisol gets released when we're stressed, so, and it's released from our adrenal glands. So here's her cortisol levels. I, ex I expected to see them high, actually, but what happens is, and hers are a little sluggish, both her, her cortisol, or excuse me, adrenal hormones, DHEA and cortisol are not quite rising as they should, in the morning, um, and that's when our cortisol levels peak soon after we wake up. So what happens under chronic stress is cortisol levels rise and they stay high, and over time our adrenal glands just can't keep up with that and they stop producing as much cortisol. So what I want to point out here is that stress has a huge impact on hormone balance. So I focus a lot with my patients on stress management. Every visit, we're checking in on what their stress levels are like and what they're doing to manage their stress. So stress, again, cortisol is that stress hormone. And it comes from the adrenal glands. It's the upstream hormone that's impacting downstream hormones like thyroid and sex hormones. So if we can get cortisol better regulated, often the other hormones will balance out naturally. So this slide's complex. <laughs> Not meant to send you running out of the room. Quick point I want to make here is about the concept of cortisol steel. So um, I know this is small and I'm sorry for that, but at the top is cholesterol from which many of our sex hormones come from and cortisol as well. And from there is a parent hormone called pregnenolone. So think of pregnenolone as the raw material that's needed to make other hormones. So from pregnenolone comes progesterone and cortisol, and when we're under chronic stress, we're shooting out a lot of cortisol, pushing the pregnenolone that direction, and less available for progesterone. So this leads to a relative progesterone deficiency and further promotes the estrogen dominant situation that's going on for Linda. So moving into treatment goals for Linda, first I want to, or these are all sort of happening around the same time at different time, uh, uh, around the same time and we're prioritizing things for her. But first we want to reduce inflammation and we're doing that by addressing her food, addressing her sleep, Look, uh, addressing um, elimination, remembering we eliminate through stool, sweat, urine, and emotional detox through tears. Um, and for Linda, I, can, I put her on an anti-inflammatory supplement as well, and I'll show you that. 
So we wanted, I wanted to set achievable initial goals for Linda. This is really important to me that my patients leave the visits feeling like they can do what we plan together um, and that they don't leave overwhelmed. So we switched up her diet, um, started with just switching her breakfast, getting her to eat more healthy proteins and fats instead of those carbohydrates that are driving her blood sugar up. And driving the blood sugar up drives the insulin up. And remember, insulin is a hormone. So that's a hormone that impacts other hormones too. We want insulin under good control. We're, and when we're eating more proteins and fats in the morning, we're able to sustain our energy longer so she's not needing that second and third cup of coffee. So we were able to get her coffee down to a cup, lower her sweets to two a week, two desserts a week. That's manageable, right? Um, get her drinking less alcohol. So she did not have to give up alcohol, but she was going to have some nights where she didn't have alcohol. And on the nights that she did, she was going to keep it to a glass. She's, um, as far as exercise goes, she was very interested in reintroducing yoga into her life. Before she had children, she was, had an active yoga practice and just didn't know how to bring that in. So we talked about how she could just do some at home with videos a couple days a week, and she did that, and it actually made a big difference. In addition, I brought in a fish oil supplement for Linda. She wasn't eating much fish, and fish oil brings us those really anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids that are really helpful to support cognition and also hormone balance. Because it's hard to know what to buy organic, I always refer to the Environmental Working Group site's site for um, patients to look at the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 foods. So in addition to um, her food and her exercise, I also brought in one of my favorite supplements called Chase Berry, which helps to support progesterone levels and create a better estrogen-progesterone balance. And because that low progesterone can really facilitate the premenstrual symptoms, and Linda, or Linda was having those, I brought this in. So another important goal is, was to teach Linda about um, reducing her exposure to what are called endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we may not know that term, but we all have heard of BPA, I'm sure phthalates, um, parabens, and these are chemicals that are in makeups and household cleaners, canned foods, hard and soft plastics. And these, these chemicals act as estrogen mimics, so like fake estrogens that are competing for our estrogen receptors in our body with our real estrogens and wreaking havoc because that these fake estrogens can cause our estrogens to be detoxed from our body in an unhealthy way to go down less healthy pathways. And those less healthy pathways can increase our risk for breast cancer. So it was really important to talk to Linda about that, which we did, and I referred her to a great app by the environmental, that the Environmental Working Group puts out called Healthy Living, where you can, um, I think they have 70,000 products in their database, and they rate the products based on their toxin content. So it's a great place to go. I know it can be overwhelming trying to figure out um, what your products have in them and whether they're safe or not. So another goal was to really support clearance of estrogens from her body um, and toxins and promote elimination. So as I mentioned earlier, one important part of that is limiting alcohol. Um, also want to get her eating a lot more uh, fruits and vegetables, lots of types, especially the cruciferous vegetables, which play a big role in clearing estrogens from our body. Wanted to get plenty of fiber on board. Also, fiber pulls toxins out of the body, and it also promotes healthy bowel movements. Um, also brought in some magnesium for her. Magnesium is one of my favorite supplements because it's a mineral that has natural muscle relaxing effects. So it can help sleep, and it can also help move bowels. I uh, wanted her sweating more through exercise, which is going to promote detoxification. And then, of course, hydration is really important for clearing toxins from our body. So 
Managing her stress, of course, is of the utmost importance. And like I said, this is something I address at every visit with all of my patients. We do a check-in on stress management. Um, and to, I, want, I introduced Linda to some mind-body medicine. For her, it was guided meditation and breathing exercises. These were easy to do for her at home. She could download free apps and really just started her on 10 minutes a day. And it doesn't take much of that to really feel the benefit from it. So our treatment goals, just to recap those, it were to reduce inflammation by addressing her nutrition, her exercise, her stress level, and her sleep, reducing exposure to those endocrine disrupting chemicals, those estrogen mimics, supporting elimination and detoxification, and bringing in those mind-body medicine approaches to help manage her stress. So in summary, um, the six-month treatment plan for Linda was to work on her food so that her food was working for her instead of against her. Um, I brought in an iron supplement, because if you remember, her iron was low. Also had brought in the, the fish oil. Exercise by bringing in that yoga a couple days a week in addition to her usual two days a week of walking. Supported her sleep with magnesium, as I mentioned earlier, and then some guided meditation before bed so that she wasn't going straight from her television to bed. Instead, she was doing a little wind-down routine, sleep hygiene. Um, brought in the chase tree herb to support that estrogen to progesterone balance and help her PMS symptoms. Worked slowly, because like I said, it can be overwhelming, but she started to clear out her, you know, things that were not so healthy and had toxins in them and replace those with healthier options. Worked on her detox with that magnesium, the fiber, more exercise, and very importantly, worked at calming her stress levels, calming her anxiety with some of those mind-body medicine approaches. She and her husband also started to schedule two date nights a month, and date night is great medicine. <laughs> um, so this is Linda, six months later, and she has more energy. Her mood is calmer. She's able to focus and concentrate when she's homeschooling her children. Her libido is back to normal. She's sleeping better. Her PMS is under better control, and she's had a modest ama amount of weight loss with a diet and exercise of about seven pounds, which she was quite pleased with. So that concludes my case. I hope you learned something, and thank you, and I'll pass things on to Dr. Godfrey.